Hello everybody, it's James here, WSI, my next guest. He's the former NWA World Heavyweight Champion and he's the current, is he, I nearly said former as well, I told you I messed these up, uh, WWE Hall of Famer along with the Four Horsemen. It is indeed Barry Windham. How the devil are you? Good to see y'all, I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah. we're, um, we're on a sort of strict hour here, aren't we? Because you're just getting a flight straight out of Kentucky as soon as we've done this, aren't we? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, then. We will crack on. I've got four pages of questions. I'm sure we won't get to half of them. But uh, in my very brief intro of you, I mentioned WWE Hall of Fame with the Four Horsemen. And that's one of the more intriguing questions uh, about you at the moment is, when did you get the call that you were going to be in the uh, WWE Hall of Fame with the Four Horsemen instead of Oli? Uh, I want to say it was probably about a year before it actually took place. Uh John Laurinaitis called me and asked me if I wanted to be in, and I said, of course. That was it. So, uh, do you remember there being any, like, fallout or anything? Because uh, there was, like, a, also a bit of a political game with not having Ole in as well. I just, I don't think Ole wanted anything to do with it. I'm sure he had the option, but Ole is Ole. He's a grouchy old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you've mentioned Oli, I mentioned Oli, and um, I brought it up with Tito Santana, who I know is in the same area as you, and you taught yesterday. And Tito said that Oli was the only person that he never had anything nice to say about. Yeah, does that go for you as well? Well, Oli was just a, just a grump and a grouch all the time, so hmm. I never had any problems with it, but he was that was just his demeanor all the time. With... Uh, with with just demeanor, but how was he as a boss? How was he as a payoff man? Would you say? Well, he was never the payoff guy. Uh, he was always just a booker wherever I was, and uh, you know he, he was good at booking the matches and all. He was an intelligent guy. He knew what he was doing. Mm. Excuse me, I was burping then. Uh, I had a diet coke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apologies, and. I suppose as a worker as well, I, I sort of get the idea that Oli is a little bit underappreciated uh, in, in as a wrestler. Uh, you know, he was a kind of ground-and-pound kind of wrestler, you know, keep keep you down on the ground. Uh, that was just Oli's style, mm. and he was always just rough and gruff. Let's say you're facing Oli right now. What's the best thing that you can do to get the most out of Oli and vice versa? How would you work, like, the optimum match? With Ole Anderson, mm -hmm. oh, I, I guess I would have to be a baby face in that match. I would just have to sell for it, <laughs> sell, and then try to get a comeback and do it as good as I could. Fine answer. Uh, we will move on then. So, I've written a lot about your career from the beginning to uh, today, pretty much, and we're going to go straight back to the beginning and. You got your start down in Florida in the late 70s, I believe, and you were trained by Blackjack Mulligan, a.k.a. your father, Robert Wyndham. Uh, I'm presuming that you always wanted to get into the business, but can you tell me what the training process was like under your father? Well, I never I never really talked about or wanted to be a wrestler. You know, it was just in, in, in our house. My father never talked about wrestling or business at, at the house. Uh, as far as training, from the time I was six years old, I worked out three times a day with my old man in the morning and then at lunch and then in the evenings. So I had a pretty strict workout schedule until I was about 20 years old. How long uh, did that last for? Weeks, months? Oh, it was my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, when did he start training with you then? I mean, did he start like trying to get you in shape as a young kid? or? Well, I mean, when I was like six or seven, he had me doing push-ups and curls, chin-ups and Pull ups, you know, stuff like that. He do squats. With um, with having a famous father in the business, uh, and I'm getting an idea of the answer already. But uh, he never taught wrestling at home. I presume that only when you got into the business of wrestling did you fully understand uh, the nature of the business. Yeah, I mean, I went to college and I was away from my dad, and I was. Uh, while I was in college, I started refereeing, and I hauled the ring and set up the chairs at all the matches for for almost two years. So I, I learned the ins and outs of the business that way too. Yeah, was it just so you're just learning it by osmosis then, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Who else trained you then? So, I mean, obviously your father, but uh, since you broke in in Florida, was it here in Matsuda? Was there Carl Gotch hanging around helping? The guy who was around the most, and, and I would say it's probably the most impressionable, is probably Dick Murdoch. Huh? Dick Murdoch was out in Navarro when I was refereeing, and I was with him almost every day. And in the ring, there was, I mean, Dick, Dick was just, uh, as far as, uh, mechanics and all he was perfect and when he wanted to he, he could work with anybody i've always so heard I, i'm sorry carry on no that, that's fine oh um i was going to say with dick murdoch i always hear that he could either do the serious match or the very very silly match and it would depend on his mood that day uh, how would the two yeah. uh, give us an example of one of each well like in a silly match he would take a bump and he would do a curly of the three students bump around on his <laughs> shoulder and go whoop, 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 while he was doing it but in a serious match you know he he was right there it was really good um uh, elaborate a bit more so when you say right there for a non-wrestler such as i'm sure you can tell i'm not a wrestler <laughs> but uh, uh but what does right there mean especially well i mean talking about murdoch and saying he was right there i mean he just you know his timing and and his work in the ring, everything was rest spot on. Mm. Well, I'm going to ask you probably to elaborate just a couple of things there. Just for like non-wrestling uh, people, is specifically timing. Is it timing as in you're both doing the move, cooperating at the exact right time, or time to do a move at the exact right time? Uh, elaborate on that, please. Well, you know, I, was, I never uh, went over matches before my match. You know, I believe in listen to the crowd, get them to react to what you're doing and try to try to get the crowd in your hand. And, uh, you know, that's just I learned that from working in Florida, listening to Eddie Graham. Uh, it's it's just the way that I learned and it's just the way that that I, I always tried to carry myself in the ring, even if it was just a two or three minute match or if it was an hour match. With uh, my interview with Tito just before, he said that it took quite a few years for him to really be able to listen to the crowd and know what the crowd wants. What's the secret to learning what to give the crowd when? Well, like I said, I was I was I trained in Florida and I was there for almost six, seven years. And Eddie Graham, you know, he was just he could spot, you know, something and tell you what to do, and it would always work, you know. And he, he was he was just that way. He was such a good psychologist, a ring psychologist, that, you know, the first thing he told me was, you know, uh, got to show your face when you're selling. You know, people come there, they got to see your face to see what your reaction is. So, you know, that was just one of the things. Uh, as far as that, then just mechanics, and then after mechanics, it's just, it's timing. And, uh, the timing, you know, with different guys, you, you learn how they move in the ring. You know, some are slower, some are quicker, and that's just something that you uh, you just you just get accustomed to. Absolutely. Um, one more thing about your father that I wanted to ask you earlier, and um, I interviewed Bill Alfonso probably last year now, and he told me a story about, uh, I think you were in the locker room, your dad was obviously in the locker room, and Buck Robley was in the locker room. And I believe Buck Robley was shouting his mouth off about something, and your dad invited him to the back to discuss it in a, a room where there was a safe, I think. This is in Florida. Do you remember anything about that? Well, I wasn't there. It was my little brother, Kendall. And I guess Buck had said something about my dad in front of my brother, you know, and it just, just pissed him off. You know, I, I never saw saw Buck, or I was never really around Buck. Mm. But you know, from what I heard, he's just that's just his character, it's the way he is. <laughs> uh, with your dad as well, is there's a couple of famous stories where Ole Anderson, I don't know what Ole Anderson would do, but he'd end up on the floor after an argument with your dad. <laughs> Were you ever around for any of those? Yeah, uh, when I was uh, in '81, when I was Blackjack Mulligan Jr., I was tagging with my dad. We were tagging against the Andersons, Ole and Gene, and almost every night it was a fight with my old man and, and Ole in the ring. And he would end up punching him out. 
Oh, he would have a bloody nose. We'd go back to the back and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Edge just didn't like Cody and all. He didn't like him. Fair enough. Then uh, was it like a was it like a hundred wins for your dad and zero for Oli, or did Oli ever get? <laughs> did he ever win a fight? I don't, with him? I don't think Oli ever got him. Yeah, <laughs> Bob Edge is pretty pretty smug. Good for him. Um, one more thing. Uh, I uh, put some questions out to some of the followers of uh, uh, my YouTube channel, and somebody mentioned uh, how much trouble, or asked, how much trouble did you get into for borrowing your dad's RV? I had two black eyes and a broken nose. Oh, my God. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> when that the... was a big backhand. <laughs> How old? I don't know the story about this. So, how old were you, and how long did I you was, borrow it for? I was sixteen, and uh, the uh, RV belonged to, to Jimmy Crockett, the Crockett's who owned the promotion. And uh, I was supposed to drive my mom and Flair's uh, wife and my family, his family, down to uh, St. Petersburg from Charlotte. So I just wanted to drive the thing and get used to it. So I was driving around town. And I went over to my girlfriend's house. I parked out in front of her house. I'm sitting on her front porch, and her dad comes up and says, your mom just called. Oh. Dude, something was up. So I went home, and I saw my dad's car at home, so I parked in front of Flair's house. Flair's house was right next door to us. I was in there just waiting, wondering what to do, and there was a knock on the door. I opened the door. It was my old man. He just looked at me. He said, Oh no! And I knew I knew it was coming. It was one of those that it, it, if I ducked it, it would just been worse. He just backhanded me, splattered my face. Oh dear! <laughs> is it, is so it the was... next day, I got up and I drove everybody to St. Pete. <laughs> <laughs> one of those things where you never did it again. I'm, I'm pretty sure. No. Yeah. Less well, roller. Uh, we'll uh, move on then. And um, until recently, I had a weekly podcast with Don Morocco. Yeah. And we discussed at length uh, your feud with Donny when he was the magnificent M. Was this in, uh, tell me through the entire uh, thing from start to end, but also was this what put you on the map, uh, Wrestling Don? Yeah, well, you know, I've been there. I was wrestling uh, Reggie Parks, Raul Mata, Ted Heath, uh, you know, just, you know, regular guys. And then, uh, Morocco was the television champion, and uh, I guess Dusty had the idea. You know, he said, I'll go Broadway with Morocco. So the first time I worked with him on TV, he beat me mm. after right right at the time. So then I challenged him the next week, and we went Broadway. And then we went we went through the time limit all the way around Florida. And then after a while, I would say it was probably maybe two or three months later, I finally beat him once, and then we were off and running after that. Why did Don shave his head? Why? I don't know. He's a big, rugged, good-looking guy. I don't know why he would shave his head. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, he just he looked like um, I don't know, he looked like a Bond villain uh, for why he shaved his head. Maybe that's why he did it. Um, yeah. I think I think the most famous thing at the time was uh, him hitting you with the pile driver on the floor there, and. Uh, I suppose it's no different than being in the ring, but how does one sort of get away with that without hurting themselves? Well, I mean, you have to trust who you're working with. And, you know, I've had guys hurt me on that exact move, and, but uh, Don, you know, was right there. He's got big legs. He put my head down there between his legs, and kept his knees bent. We were good. He's a professional. Yeah. I, oh, I always like to hear a great story about Don. And uh, aside from the fact that he always gets fired in the funniest ways from wherever he's working, he's told me about so many stories. But as a, as a wrestler, he always downplays how good he was. But you tell me how great he was. Yeah, he really was. I mean, he, he led me around. And, and I was, you know, I had just been maybe two or three months in the ring. So, you know, it was... I'm sure it was a tough on it because all I did was sell. He would beat me down. It'd be like beating a rag doll. He'd have to pick me up. And, you know, sometimes he'd try to cover me and then two count, he'd pick my head up. But, you know, it was just, we're just trying to establish my character as somebody that won't quit, you know, that'll keep on. And Don was right there with it. Mm, absolutely. Uh, also, everywhere of, he's been, it's been great. Uh, of, of, um, of all the people, I know Don can 
put some drinks down. I know you can put some drinks down. I know there's the Briscoes, there's everybody else in Florida, but who was the drinker of all drinkers in Florida? Oh. Well, I mean, nobody can out drink Andre. Andre was, was there down in Florida quite a bit. But regular drinkers, I don't know. I, I mean, we drank so much, I don't know who drank the most. <laughs> <laughs> It's all just blurry at a certain yeah. point, I take it. Um, because you mentioned Andre, um, something I've never asked about Andre is when he would come into Florida, for example, how much would the house jump up in uh, thousands, I imagine? Well, I mean, he was usually only here, you know, for big shows. We ran like a St. Pete or Lakeland where there, there were special Saturday night shows. He would come on those and, you know, he was always an attraction. Exactly how much he added, I don't know. I was just, you know, I was young and I didn't pay attention to those things. You know, I was still excited about going to the ring and having a match. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he definitely added. With uh, Andre, you're a, you're a big boy yourself. I, uh, what height were you billed as? And was it your real height? Was it about 6'6"? Six, six? I'm... I, was right at six six, and then I wore those boots. So I was probably six seven, six eight. In those boots. So, so you're a not a small man. Uh, so someone who almost sort of saw eye to eye with Andre the Giant. What do you think his real height was? Uh, he, he was close to seven foot. I mean, he was there. He was a big. He was a big old rascal. I've got a story about Andre. Uh, whenever he come to Florida, he would ride with me because he knew my dad. And, you know, anyway, uh, we had a, a, a Cadillac limousine that we drove sometimes on the road in Florida. Mike Graham owned it. And we drove it. Well, it was me and Andre in the limousine. So I took him to Tallahassee, Florida. Well, we had our matches. And we were through and we were heading out. We had to hit the liquor store. So he said, get me a case of Blue Nun wine. <laughs> so I got my case. 12 bottles of boot on wine, a bottle of boot on wine, you know, he could hold between his fingers like this. So we're heading out of, out of Tallahassee, heading towards uh, Tampa. And he says uh, he wanted to make it back to the lounge before last call. And it was like 11 o'clock. Last call was like at two. So I said, we can just make it. So I put the hammer down. I'm running 126 miles an hour. And I see a blue light, probably four or five miles behind me. Is he straightaways? And I said, Andre, there's a cop behind us. He says, Well, pretty fast, you can outrun him. So I kept going. <laughs> this cop caught us. It took him about 30 minutes. He caught us. And he was red hot, man. And he was a big, tall guy. He was probably 6'9, 6'10, real skinny. And he came to the window. He beat on the window. He says, What the fuck are you doing driving so fast? I scrape people off this highway. And I said, I've just taken Andre to the to his airplane. He's got to make a flight. He said, I don't care who you got in there. And about that time, Andre pushed the door open and he stuck his boot out. He got out of that <laughs> door. And I saw that guy look down at Andre's boot and he took like five steps back, like stagger steps. Andre stepped out and this guy looked up at him. He went back to his car, sat in his car, and we sat there for probably maybe just five minutes. He came back and he says, I'm going to write you a ticket, but I'm going to let you go. And he says, I'm going to have every highway patrolman between here in Tampa watch it for you. So he wrote me a ticket, 126 miles an hour. Andre said, well, I'll pay it for you, no problem, <laughs> which I never saw. But uh, <laughs> so as soon as that cop turned around and went the other way, we hightailed him. I got, him to, got Andre to the bar <laughs> just before last call. Did you were you driving That's, your own car or was it always rental cars? Because if it was always rental cars, how were they going to find you? Yeah, well, it, like like that was Mike's uh, that was Mike's car that he used for the road. Uh, when we traveled together down there, we'd rent you know the little uh, Dodge vans. Sometimes we'd all travel together, but usually, uh, I'd say from about eighty four, eighty five on. I usually travel with just one other person or maybe maybe two. Mike Graham and the referee, uh, Pee Wee. Uh, but other than that, you know, just uh, rental cars are the way to go for all the boys we travel together. Absolutely. Uh, now, I'm going to be skipping through, obviously, 
a lot of your career to get to uh, some of the questions because we've only got an hour. Yeah. And I over, I, I over, I write, I've written a novella of like worth of questions for you. So, but I'm going to skip straight yeah. to uh, the WWF. And you're a big star in Florida. We're talking late 1984. And as far as I understand it, around late 84, Dusty Rhodes leaves as Booker. Dutch Mantel replaces him as Booker. But Dusty goes to Jim Crockett Promotions and takes most of the talent with him. Uh, did Dusty ever yeah. make a play uh, to take you as well? Yeah, I, I went to the Carolinas with Dusty at that point. And I was there for probably four months. But uh, the payoffs were just pitiful. I mean, after I had three three weeks of a hundred dollar checks, and that was just too much, you know. I, you know, I just knew there was more money to be made. Yeah. So, I mean, were you kept at the bottom of the card, or did he just underpay you essentially? No, it was just you know, just it was when Dusty was first taking over, so they were switching out a, an old crew, and we were getting new faces. You know, to, for the people to recognize the houses just weren't there for a while. But uh, probably, you know, the thing that that uh, probably got under my skin, the Road Warriors had a $750,000 contract with uh, Crockett. And, you know, I was working with, I was their tag partner and working against them with them. And, and I had no guarantee. I was making a hundred bucks. So just, I had, I, I called, uh, uh, I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, uh, talked to Vince, and Vince said, come on up. So three days later, I was up working for New York. George Scott? Yeah, George Scott. There you go. Uh, yeah, he was booking in late 84, wasn't he? I always, I always yeah. forget who was booking where. So, yo, so you actually made the call then and said, I'm getting paid nothing, make me a better offer. Simple as that. Well, it's just that... Uh, I think I did mention how much I made. And he said, you know, you'll make a lot more than that. And I did. The first week I made 2500 bucks, mm. you know, which helped pay some bills <laughs> that I yeah. had from the other company. You're telling me. Um, do you, uh, did you ever have a one-on-one one -on -one meeting with Vince McMahon when you first went up there? Or were you just given a directed by George Scott, turn up at this town, and that's that? No, nah, never really any one-on-ones with Vince. Uh, you know, just maybe... This may be talking over a match or, or asking, you know, something for one of the, uh, some of the talent, you know, when I was an agent, if finish was okay, just something like that. Uh, let's see, is that you low battery or is that me? Uh, it's going to be you low battery, but uh, a, a, a wire will, will turn up soon enough uh, to uh, plug it in. All right. There we go. Okay, so... Um, when you were in WWF at first, uh, you brought in as a single star. So, and I was looking at some of the people you beat, and these are some big names: Paul Orndorff, Greg Valentine, Doctor D, David Schultz. I mean, straight off, it looks like the WWF had big plans for you. Yeah, uh, uh, and then uh, I guess I was there about three months, and then I talked Rotundo into coming up there, and uh, we were together, and we were off and running. Mm. Uh, well, that actually uh, brings me to my next question. So it was actually you who brought Mike up, and was it you who wanted to team up with him? Yeah, I mean, I had been talking to Vince about it, telling him, you know, he was my brother-in-law, he was my new brother-in-law, probably my best friend, and, you know, I was just going to bat for it. So, uh, so there was actually uh, how am I going to say this? So yeah, so you you're having a great run as a single star, and then you're put into a tag uh, tag team with your brother-in-law, and we worried that like you're going to get like a derailed push as a single star, or you thought it was going to be temporary. I mean, what were these sort of like long-term plans with the uh, the US Express? Uh, you know, back then we didn't really talk long-term. You know. We had been in territory, so we lived week to week you know, right before that. And I had just come from Charlotte making a hundred dollars a week, so I was just happy to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so we were just glad we were on the roster. Yeah, it's a fine attitude to have as well. Um, I don't think many people know this, but when was the first time you heard your theme entrance music, Real American? Oh, let's see. It 
was I know it was 85, but I don't remember the city. I want to say it was like Philadelphia or something like that. But uh, yeah, that song was ours and then Hogan took it after uh, after all the uh, copyright on uh, all the songs that all the guys were using. But yeah. we were using more in the USA and Springsteen didn't want to choose that and would have had to pay a royalty fee and all that. So I believe I believe that uh Hulk Hogan had uh, Eye of the Tiger at the time to coincide with his Rocky appearance. Yeah. 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 Are, you, are you a fan of Real American as a theme song? Were you like, eh, it's pretty good, or would you have preferred something completely different? No, I mean, it's fine. I, I didn't have any preferences, and it was, it was a good, easy song. Yeah. Uh, I think the most famous match that you're involved in as the US Express is, of course, Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik. Uh, before I get on the Sheik, because everyone loves a Sheiky story, um, how hard did he smash you in the head with that cane? It looked like he killed you with it at WrestleMania one. Uh, well, I just remember getting head to head. I had a little lump, but it wasn't anything. You know, I always wanted stuff to look good and look right, so I probably told him to lay it in, and he did. <laughs> with Sheiky Baby, um, Everyone's got a crazy Sheiky Baby story and a very cheap Nikolai Volkov story. So uh, if, if you've got one, please share it. Well, the, the Sheik, you know, he, he doesn't hide it from anybody. He smokes a lot of marijuana. But we're on a flight from, I want to say it's like from Kansas City to Seattle. And the plane wasn't full. And a lot of the boys were laying down in the seats. But the Sheik... Mike and I were like three rows in front of him, and the sheik had to see his daddy, daddy. So he sticks his head just over the over the top of the seat, and then he shows us this little one hitter pipe, and then he ducks down and he hits it in the floorboard, and he blew it in the floor, and then he sat up. And said, <laughs> yes. But when we landed, they had the U.S. Marshals there to get him. Ah. <laughs> they took him off the plane before everybody got off. And he was at the show that night. But I guess that happened to him a few times. <laughs> Do you remember like what he ended up getting? Did he get a fine or anything? Or did he manage to talk his way out of it? You know, I, I don't remember what it was. And he didn't go to jail, so he must have got out of it somehow. I think um, I've heard a couple of stories with Sheik where, let's say, he's in... Um, well, we don't have this here. It's really alien, but a dry county. So you, yeah. they don't serve, like, drinks on a Sunday or something like that. And yet, with just the sheer force of him just being, like, really overbearing and annoying, he would always t- he would always get beer no matter where he came, you know, no matter what, what story on what day it came from. Yeah. Yeah, he would always uh, find him a corner and go and do his Hindu squats and drink a few beers and have a few tokes, and he was ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him. Um Something else that people have asked me to ask you is how come you sort of left so abruptly? It was we talking like early uh, mid nineteen eighty six, leaving the WWF. Uh, oh well, we've been working, and I mean we were doing great. And, uh, we've been asking George Scott for a day off because we need to go home. We just need to go home and take care of some business, and like three, four, five TVs in a row. You know, he said, next week, next week, ask me. Well, after we worked 90 days straight on the road, it was 96, I think. And uh, we were at Baltimore, Maryland, and it just blew up. Uh, Mike went home, and then I followed him home, and he came back, and I stayed home. <laughs> so it was actually Mike who went home first then? Yeah. So, yeah. so was it just... I mean, 96 days on the road is, is impossible to deal with for almost anyone, I'm sure. Um, well, you, the way we travel, too, from coast to coast each day, you know, it would be Seattle at night, and then Miami the next day, there weren't clumping them. They were all zigzag, so it was really tough travel. Yeah. Um, I, do you... Um, I'm sure you might may have heard this before, but, like, do, do certain people get, like, institutionalized, like, the road life, and then just can't cope at home i know rick flair is an obvious example but i mean what sort of percentage of wrestlers couldn't cope when they eventually got off the road and went back home you know he just uh it wasn't hard for me to transition 
because I like being home. But, uh, you know, some guys, you know, like Flair, he just he craves the attention of the fans. And, and I guess he just can't stand being alone either. So, you know, it's just a lot of people are that way. There's a lot of the guys are that way too. Yeah, absolutely. Um one more thing is, uh, after you uh, and Mike leave, Mike turns back up, US Express continues with Danny Spivey. Did you realize that he was going to be your replacement before he debuted, or was this a big surprise to you? No, and and I wasn't paying attention either. I had taken my phone out of the wall at home, and I took about three weeks off, and then I just went started back wrestling there in Florida for Championship Wrestling in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you ever wrestle Danny as like you know the U.S. Express explodes kind of like a mega match? I don't. It seems like I worked with Spivey sometime in a tag match, maybe him and Mark Callis against me and somebody, and uh, but I don't really recall working with Spivey that clearly. Uh, we'll, uh, and as I keep saying, we're skipping ahead a bit. We're, we're missing the AWA. I would have loved to know why you weren't in the rap video for the uh, Wrestle Rock Rumble. Do you, <laughs> do, you, do you remember that at least? Well, the AWA, I never really worked for them. I just worked one show in the, at the uh, Minneapolis Dome that they had. Mm-hmm. And Rotundo and I worked there. We worked with, uh, I think, you know, Steve Kern and Stan Lane. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't. We weren't part of the videos for that. No, it's a shame we never got to see you rapping. But uh, there's so many of the wrestlers, <laughs> none of them could do it. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's get right into the uh, meat of uh, Jim Crockett promotions then, and Ric Flair. And obviously, uh, one of the most famous things you were a part of with a litany of 60 minute time limit draws with Rick, and you know, put you on the map further. Uh, before we talk about the, uh, those, though, did you see Ric Flair's last match or last match? Oh. No, I didn't see it. I was there, and I was there for the weekend, but uh, I headed out before that evening's match, and I've only seen just a couple of little little clips of it. Oh. saw one of him, of him bleeding and one of him leaving the ring, and I didn't see any of the match. Yeah. I really didn't want to see it. <laughs> mm, I, I, I understand you. Um, did you party with Ric Flair and Kid Rock afterwards? Did I? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I missed out on that one. No, never mind then. Um, well, we'll talk about Ric Flair then. Is just Ric Flair the easiest person in the world to have a 60-minute match with? Yeah, I mean, I worked with him enough to where I knew, you know, basically what he would do in the ring. And, and he had worked with me enough to where he knew what I would do. We would never call any spots or anything. All those matches we had were just, you know, just cold right in there. And uh, it was, you know, it was just uh, our training and ability that we did that on. We didn't plan out any of the spots or anything before. And even the finish, you know, we left those open too sometimes. Mm-hmm. Just how we would do it. With, uh, I don't understand why. I mean, I do understand why. But some people use that as a knock against Rick that he always has the same match. But it's like he always has the same match and he sold out arenas for 25 years with it. So... Or probably longer, in fact. So, uh, I mean, that should be a testament to him, surely. Well, it's not that he always has the same match. It's just that some of the bumps that he incorporates in the, the flip in the corner and, the, and the, the fall of your head spot, you know, it's just it's it's just typical Ric Flair stuff. And, and if he doesn't do it, you wonder what's going on. So. <laughs> There's two sides to that story. Um, how many uh, matches do you think you wrestled Ric Flair in? And if you can pick one, do you have a favorite? I'm sure I wrestled Rick at least a couple of hundred times. Uh, probably, I mean, at least, I would say probably two or three hundred times I wrestled Rick. Mm. And, you know, he was... He was always really good in the ring. It was always easy. Any uh, any specific match that stands out? Or if you've had so many, do they all blend in together? Not any one in particular. I mean, you know, people always bring up the one, you know, that we did on the worldwide uh, the Hour Broadway on TV. 
but uh, I don't even think that was actually an hour. I think it was like 48 or 50 minutes or maybe 55. But, you know, in, in the towns where we did it, we went hours. And it was, uh, I guess, you know, I was asked to do those with Rick because they knew that I could do it. You know, there's a lot of guys that, that could and they and they didn't. I'm uh, going to skip ahead a bit here, and we're going to go to 1991, but it does sort of tie in. And this is the yeah. Great American Bash, and sort of memorable for the wrong reasons. And I remember actually seeing a video of it after the fact, and I just remember thinking, poor Barry, because it wasn't your fault, it wasn't Lex Luger's fault. The fans wanted Flair, and they chanted, we want Flair all the way through. How would you, I mean, how did you deal with those chants, and what would you have done differently in that event? Well, I mean, I never let any of the chance or anything like that bother me anyway. I always, you know, conducted my business and had a match and, you know, always stayed right to it. it you know, unless there was a spot or something where you were trying to sell sell to what they were doing, you would you would do that. But I never really let it bother me in the ring, any of the chance or anything. No. With them... Um... Wrestling Lex Luger, and off the top of my head, uh, I think Lex Luger aligns with Harley Race, and the fans boo even more. I mean, would you have... I'm presuming, looking back, you would have had you win and send the fans home happier, at least, than that. Well, that's what it was originally planned, but because Rick left, and, uh, you know, we, we needed to put the, the title on a heel, and they they needed to... They needed to elevate somebody up to, to Rick's status, so it was just a stepping stone for Luger. Mm. And you know, I understood that. I, I understood business. I always did, and it was not a problem for me to do that. Uh, we'll go back again now. Do it a bit more timeline uh, like, and you end up teaming with Ronnie Garvin. I think we're talking. I don't know if this is eighty six or eighty seven, but. When I look at Ronnie Garvin wrestling, I just every single thing he throws, it just looks like, oh my god, he just killed him. <laughs> Whether it's a punch or a kick, was he actually just killing yeah. people? Or no, Ronnie was a real good worker, real good, real smooth. Uh, we were tag champs there for a while, and uh, we, he was a great partner and a great worker. Did he only dress up as a woman for TV, or is this something he liked to do uh, on his off days as well? I'm sure it was just for TV. <laughs> <laughs> He's a woman for that. Uh, uh, with the Midnight Express feud, uh, I, this was something else that a lot of people wanted me to bring up to you and talk about Stan Lane. Talk, because it was Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton, wasn't it? You never wrestled uh, Dennis Condry, did you? Yeah, I did. I wrestled Condry. Oh, right. So you, were you part of the switchover when Condry became Stan Lane, in a sense? Yeah, I was there when they did that, yeah. Mm. Do you remember but, when Dennis Condry uh, left? I don't. I don't know why he left, but I do remember when he did. It was probably over a payoff, or either, or either he just wanted to be home. I mean, we were traveling a lot then. I think that's pretty likely. Um, who? I know it's an unfair question, but uh, who did you prefer to work with, Dennis Condry or Stan Lane? Well, I knew Stan a lot better. You know, I had worked with Stan a lot, so it was probably easier for me to work with Stan. But Dennis was a great worker, too. I mean, he was, you know, when I say he was right there, that means, you know, somebody that, you know, you can count on it. There's no lapse in timing when you're there. So, you know, he was a ride-on guy. With uh, Bobby Eaton, I mean, is he the nicest man in wrestling? Probably. <laughs> yes, he was. Yeah, Bobby was special. Yeah. How would his, uh, just, just too nice for the business sort of thing. How would that How would that manifest? What would you do for people? What would you do uh, to uh, to be so nice to them? Well, I, I think it was really just in the dress rooms, you know, because everybody ribbed Bobby, you know, about how, how nice he was. But, you know, I, I never heard – I just heard Bobby maybe raise his voice once or twice in all the years I knew him. But, uh, you know, he was just always an easygoing, nice, never had anything bad to say about anybody. Just a great guy. And he had a big duffel bag, didn't he, with everything in it? <laughs> yeah, he carried everything with it. <laughs> what was the weirdest thing he it, had in his bag? Pro 
probably some dog collars. He had a, he had like four or five dog collars that I knew of. <laughs> and I don't know why he had them. I was going to ask why did he have them, but I mean, well, that'll have to remain a mystery. It sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sticking on with the Midnight Express, Jim Cornette. Everybody's got a Jim Cornette story. Uh, you know, I was around Jim. I didn't really interact with him a lot. Uh, as far as stories, I mean, we all flew on the. We had a plane that was it was the G one, and it was I guess it seated probably maybe twenty five, maybe thirty people, and we would all fly on that plane. And I remember us getting uh, Jim drunk. We would shotgun beers, cut a hole in the bottom of the beer, drink it as fast as you can. Well, he was shotgunning diet sodas. Right. So we got him. <laughs> we got him to shotgun one beer, and he was plastered on one beer. <laughs> he was laughing and giggling and laying on the couch and in the floor. He he was pretty wild. That was just one beer. With a. Uh... Oh, do you know, I've got so many questions what I'll ask. I was going to ask about the UWF. I was going to ask about various plane rides in the, in the Crockett planes, and I believe one was called the Jabroni Jet, which is always a, a funny name to have. Um, I'm going to see where I'm going to go with this. And WWF again, we'll go there. And you turn up as the Widowmaker. Uh, what was the concept of the Widowmaker? Because it just looked like Barry Windham to me. You know, I was just trying to get Vince to bring me in as Barry Windham, you know, instead of the stalker or the Widowmaker, but he would never do it. He just, he wanted to put those tags on me. Mm. So, you know, he did it. And I went along with it. And then, you know, that was a short lived deal there because my dad and my brother had some problems. So, you know, uh, Widowmaker didn't last very long. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe six months, I think. Maybe probably, probably not even that. I think maybe about four. Uh, so, if someone described, I mean, someone must have described to you, you're the widow maker. This is your motivation. I mean, what was the widow maker supposed to be that separated the widow maker from Barry Windham? That I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the widow maker was just supposed to be. Uh, uh, I really didn't have time to develop the character. Mm. I mean, we just did we did a few promos, and I was on some pre tapes for some for some shows, but it really got it was in the damper before it really got going. Uh, I know why you left the Widowmaker thing. Uh, I'm happy to just skip over that if you prefer me to skip over it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I'll skip over it then. And. Goodness me, what am I going to talk to you about now? Uh, I know you were here for this one, and it's one of my favourite stories of all time, and I think you were at the bar. Sid, Brian Pillman, and the Squeegee. Well, you know what? It wasn't Brian Pillman in that story. It was uh, Mike Grant. Oh. And what it was, Mike was an agent for uh, WCW, and there was... There was a bar that we always drank at. It was a Hall uh, Howard Johnson's, where all the guys stayed there in Atlanta. And there was a bar there. Well, Sid was there, and uh, Mike was there. And Sid, Sid had gotten mad at Mike was going to do something, so Sid went out to his car and got his squeegee, his window squeegee. Came back and told Mike he was going to, I don't know, he was going to stick it up his ass or something. Clean Mike it. took it away from him. And Mike is like five seven, maybe five six. And he stood there, he just took that thing from Sid and he said, I'll stick this thing up your ass sideways. And Sid just sat down, didn't say another word. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, they always get that story mixed up. It, it was Mike Graham that was actually with the squeegee, not Pillman. No, I mean, same with me. I, I got him mixed up as well. Was Mike Graham always trying to start fights? Because I hear so many stories about Mike Graham. Well, you know, I guess people didn't like him. You know, he was a little guy, but he had, you know, a big ego. And, you know, he had been the son son of the promoter down in Florida in a successful territory. And he was, you know, he was a smart guy too. So, But he had a smart mouth and he liked to drink. So mm. and he would drink, he would go off. He would get in fights. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, is there anyone else you want to mention he had a fight with, or shall I just roll on? Yeah, we'll just go on. Roll on then. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to throw some of my 
best questions at you. And this one I call name association, a bit of a game. I'm going to give you a sentence and it's probably just like a one name answer. You just tell me the name that you think best fits that. The first one that comes to your mind, funniest person in the locker room. Uh, probably Kirk. Fine answer. The, uh, and, and you, you may not know because it gets a bit blurry at this time of night, but uh, the last man sta- uh, standing at the bar. Uh, yeah, I closed down quite a few of them. Uh, guys that were there with me. Mike Graham was always there with me. I mean, he would be drunk. I'd have to carry him out. <laughs> <laughs> but Rotundo could drink too. Mm. He could drink pretty well. Um. Right, this is might need a bit of an explanation, but who was the best shot at shooting road signs while you're driving past them? I was. I could hit them from the driver's side. I, I drove convertibles. I could hit them that way. I get them through the side window, and I would try to do them as fast as I could, too. So like 90 and 100 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> What's the and I could, hit, I could hit the small little marker signs that had the numbers on them for the miles. <laughs> Are we talking yards? How many yards away could you like nail one of them suckers while driving? Let's see. Probably, let's see, the shoulder, and then they're off the road, probably maybe 40, 50 feet, you know, outside of the car, and as you're going that fast. There you go. I've never asked that question before. I'm so glad you had a good answer <laughs> for me as well. Uh, the smelliest wrestler you uh, ever got in the ring with? Leon Vader. You're not the he first person. never washed his gear. You are not the first person to say Vader. Um, the most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in could be wrestlers, could be with fans. Uh, I was in Puerto Rico, and I had just worked with Carlos Colon on the last match. And before I went up to the ring, I told my brother, I was there with my brother, Rotundo, I, I told him, I said, go get the car and have the car wait, and I'll come straight from the ring out to the car. Well, and, you know, Carlos is always bleeding and bloody and all that, and I was bleeding. Uh, we finish our match, and I leave to go out, and the crowd is letting out too. And I was the heel over there in the match against Carlos. So they start coming after me, and I'm looking for Rotundo, and I see him, and he's about 400 yards away, and he's flashing his lights, and there's a, the stadium is letting out. It's a baseball stadium, and there's thousands of people. Well, I'm at the front, and I'm in my boots and my tights, and I'm running, trying to get in the car. I'm looking behind me. They start running. I start running. I ran all the way to the car. Rotundo had turned it around to the right. They had the window down. I dove in the window, and I, I we got out of there just before they got to me. <laughs> but, you know, you always hear horror stories in Puerto Rico about people getting stabbed, and it was just, you know, it had just that vibe to it. You know, I could feel it in the crowd. You know, they were they were hot at me, and I got out of there as quick as I could. <laughs> All you had to say was Puerto Rico. I was like, "Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about." <laughs> yeah. I do um I do a weekly show with Dutch Mantel as well. So the amount of goodness me, the amount of Puerto oh, yeah. Rico stories he's lived through. Yeah, he has been put on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's probably he, he whipped him into a frenzy as uh, as 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 good as most, I believe. Um, the stiffest wrestler you ever faced. You know, Kevin Sullivan is pretty stiff. I mean, he does a stomp where he stomps on your stomach, and he thinks he thinks he's working it, but he's not. <laughs> he's touched my belly button to my spine at least ten times, and it's just terrible. And even if you tense up, you know it's coming. <laughs> um, this is a new question as well that someone suggested. Um, the biggest sandbagger who would just never go up for moves. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to say it anymore. Uh, well, I will. I'll say it was Larry Zabisco. Yeah, I worked with Larry later in his career, and he wanted to walk and talk in the match, and I wanted to, you know, take bumps and sell and go outside the ring. So Larry sandbagged on me quite a bit. Naughty Larry. Uh, I've interviewed him <laughs> once before as well. He was great. I hope to interview him yeah. again. Uh, I'm going to give you a few more, and then we'll move on to sort of the finale, I think. Um, most memorable backstage fight? You know, I never... Well, let's see. 
fights that I was in, I fought Manny Fernandez one time because he, he stole my pickup truck while I was gone and he sold it. So I got back and I had no car. So I punched him in the head at the sportatorium. And that was about the, the max of that fight. And, you know, I would say that's about it. I, mean, I was around a lot of fights and stuff. <laughs> Still, it's a good Besides reason. My old, man. <laughs> yeah, my old man just beat that bully. <laughs> I was going to say, it's a great reason to punch Manny. I think I think that's fair enough. Um, big uh, nicest man in wrestling, or nicest person in wrestling. Too nice for the business. Well, I probably have to go with Bobby again. Bobby was just all around good guy. Yeah. Um, the town with the most eager ladies. I'd have to say Miami. Mm, fine answer. Um, <laughs> This one you might not have an answer for, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Loudest spot caller? Sid Vicious. <laughs> really? Yeah. It, it, we, we were in a, in one of the uh, uh, War Games matches, and he's calling a spot to Arn just as loud as I'm talking right now in the middle of the ring. Arn looked at him. I looked at him. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> He's like basically hollering out spots. <laughs> I'll um because you mentioned Sid and I always love a good Sid story. I mean, did you did you spend any time with Sid? He's a uh, someone with some idiosyncrasies that I uh, I'm led to believe. I was never really around Sid that much. You know, he and Rotundo traveled together. They were good friends, but uh, I was never never really traveled with Sid or was around him very much. No. Okay, uh, I'll ask you a couple more. Uh, biggest ribber. Probably either Kurt or uh, uh, Owen. Mm -hmm. Now, just because you mentioned Owen Hart, I've written a book about Owen Hart. I, it's somewhere I, I can't advertise it, but um, in a match with you, he rolls your he rolls his own ankle. Do you remember that match? No, I don't remember that specific match. It was um, it was early '98. And he's, I think he's doing like the 10 punches in the corner and he just jumps off the second rope and just rolls his ankle. And he ends up in a boot for like a, 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 like a month and a half. So like, it's, just, it's just funny that the, the smallest things are the ones that get you when you're just not quite paying yeah. attention. Yeah. I hope I didn't have anything to do with that. No, you had nothing. Never mentioned it to me, yeah. No, you had nothing to do with it. He just, just landed wrong on his own. Um, I'll give you one more. The most talented wrestler you ever worked with. Probably Brad Armstrong. Brad was just, I mean, you know, he, he was brought up in the business. He had a bunch of brothers in the business. Dad, Brad could just go, you know, and he just never got that break. Mm -hmm. He was, he was a real, a really talented competitor. And I'm surprised you never said funniest as well, because he's the name that comes up more than any other for funniest wrestler. Yeah, he was always, he was real sharp wit. I'll, um, we've got, Slightly under 10 minutes left. I'll ask you a couple of questions and then thank you for your time. And I'm going to ask you, I know you mentioned it before briefly, but this is when I was watching wrestling and the Stalker uh, character, you come back in the WWF in 1996. How does Vince pitch the Stalker to you? What are you as the Stalker? I think that it... Uh... I was I was in a meeting with him, Bruce Pritchard, JJ Dillon, and we're all sitting there. And he just said, he says, "I've got an idea, of something I want to do." He said, "I want you to paint your face up, and I want you to be a stalker. You're stalking everybody." And I was trying to get the idea of it. I was trying to put it in there, and thinking, paint my face. You know, it just. It, I always tried to skimp on them too, you know. I didn't always paint my face all the way up, and I wore my cowboy boots underneath my <laughs> camo pants and shit like that. He didn't like, you know. But it was just me trying to get my character out, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, as far as I could tell, you watch these vignettes, and like Rambo, survivalist with PTSD, lives in the woods, and. I always find these repackagings so odd when you've already been the WWF twice and you're a former NWA world champion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I was, you know, I've been the 
uh, NWA champ just a few years before. And, you know, he, he I don't know, I guess maybe, you know, maybe his reasoning was that I could work well enough to where I could make something work. And I guess that's his reasoning or, or he could make it work, and, but it never did. With, uh, I mean, I've, I've got to mention this. You were built from the environment, which I think is a great hometown to be built from. But <laughs> um, it's, uh, there's something that keeps coming up as a theme with Vince McMahon when I do these interviews, and it is he has to break you down and mould you in his own image for him to get behind you. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I mean, well, you can see all of his guys that he molded and built himself are his stars. You know, guys that hadn't really been anywhere else. You know, seeing of the rock uh, undertaker was just down at WCW just for a short time. Uh, Hogan was there, you know, was never there except for towards the end. So, you know, he always believed that he created his own guys and made his own talent. And I think, you know, that was where it hurt me, you know, was that, you know, I was already wrestling and I was his very one of it. He just wanted to create something else that had his yeah. finger. Um, now, if you watch the vignettes, I'm sorry I'm harping on on this, but I, I just really enjoy it. I just really enjoy it. It's, it's such an odd... The Stalker's such an odd baby face. Do you remember why you debuted with all these, uh, you know, evil vignettes where you're going to kill people, basically, and then you debut as a hand-waving baby face? I honestly don't know. And I was wondering myself, you know, I was wondering what I was going to be, a healer or a baby face. And he said, oh, you're a baby face. So I went out there and tried to work as a baby face. And, you know, it's just, I believe that, you know, to work and sell, people have to be able to sell, see your face. And when your face completely painted up, you know, you lose that. And, and that was something that I counted on, you know, for my work and my character, is to sell with my face. Now, um, some of my research suggests this, is that originally you were going to debut as a bad guy and the uh, creative directive that was originally given was that you were going to feud with Mark Mero and you were going to cut Sable's throat. Do you remember any of that? No, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> I was going to cut Sable's throat. Huh? Yeah, well, you know, as a, as a Rambo uh, living out in the woods survivalist for your life, I mean, you know, hunting your prey, I mean, that that's apparently what it was going to be. Yeah, I don't know how he could have got away with that on TV. <laughs> no, it doesn't strike me as advertiser-friendly. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, um... I'm sure that's just made up. <laughs> well, it might have been Bruce Pritchard or someone who... Uh... First, yeah. first ventured that one out, but we'll never know. I think we've got Bruce time was in charge of that character too, the stalker. Mm -hmm. Oh, did he? It did he film been, the vignettes with been, you? Yeah, you know it may have been Pritchard's idea. Now that I think about it, because mm. so, he was put in charge of it right away. Uh, we have time for one more question, maybe two. We'll see how far we get with it. But um, we're going back to WCW for your final run, WCW. West Texas Rednecks. Man, that's a good song. Kurt Hennig can't sing for shit. And it's still a good song, that rap is crap thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he and I were riding down the road one day, and uh, he said, uh, he said, I'm talking to Jimmy Hart about uh, lots of stuff, and he's got an idea for a song. So Jimmy wrote a song. Kurt went and recorded it, and uh, the rest of it was a good time doing that. We were supposed to be the heels, but we ended up being baby faces. Well, exactly. Uh, did you volunteer for you to sing instead? I mean, you can't be any worse than Kurt was, surely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? You, you're a worse singer than Kurt? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, dearie me. Did you um? Did you ever learn any of... I don't even know what instrument you were supposed to be playing in the video. Did you have... Can you play an instrument? I was playing a drum that had towels folded on it so I wouldn't make any noise. <laughs> I was beating on the towels. Doing the best I could to keep them beat. No, now, I can't play any instruments. You know, with um, with WCW, especially at that time, didn't look like many people were having fun, but, I mean, it looked like you guys were having fun. Yeah, we were. And, and it was because it was working and it was going completely opposite the way that they wanted it to. Mm. They wanted us to be heels and we were baby faces and we were enjoying it. 
Yeah, with Master P and his No Limit Soldiers. Um, uh, call me armchair booker, but there's 12 of them. You're in the South. It's a Southern company where country, I imagine, is more popular than in the North. So, you know, it's a Southern-based country. Country, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, promotion, country music. You're faced with overwhelming odds, four against like 10 or four against 12. Like, how do they expect well, it to go any different? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of them, and, and none of them knew how to work either. So we were having to move them around and position them and put them in place and go through the finishes and all that. Uh, you know, Conan could work and Ray Mysterio, but but uh, as far as uh, the rest of Master P's crew, they were tough to move around. <laughs> yeah, swole especially. Um, I've uh, got the nod that it's at the hour mark. I've got to let you go. I wrote four pages worth of questions. We didn't get, even get to half of them. So if you ever come back, I'd love to interview you again. So thank you so much for uh, doing this for me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll do the sign-off now. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll catch you again next week, whoever we have on. Um, do you have any plugs you want to get out there, Barry? All right. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Do you, sorry, do you have any plugs you want to get out there? Anything to send people to? Um, or? Trying to shut the phone down. Uh, what were you saying again? Uh, I was Sorry. saying, did, did you have any plugs you wanted to get out before I sh sign off? No, I don't have anything to plug. That's fine. Though, I right? appreciate it. Though. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it as well. Thank you very much, and thank you. All right, thank you.